Get all the children up here. Come on. You can help me tell the story. You want to sit up on the steps? Come on. Hurry, 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 hurry. Don't, we don't run, though, remember? That's right. We learned that Wednesday night, but we can hurry. I don't know about you guys, but I think we might need an amen on all these kids here today. What do you think? Yeah. Hey, do we need baby Grace up here? Come on. Come on, Timmy. Come on. Mom can bring you. Sit on the steps. Sit on the steps. Hey, what? <laughs> I don't think I need to be up here at all <laughs> if we get Timmy up here. And what about baby Grace? Is she coming? No? No? Nope. Okay. Let's see. How will I stand here? Can you guys go over this a little closer? And then I'll get on one side of you. Do you get close to girls? Okay, all right. <laughs> Told Dennis we'd make this fast because he always wonders about the time. I think you bet. I bet you know this is a special day today. What is it? I knew you would know that. You know, we have to really behave today because you know what we have out here? Besides mothers, we have our mayor, and we have a judge, and we have a superintendent, and we have a couple of policemen. We got to really behave here, don't we? <laughs> I wanted to show you, this is a Mother's Day, and I wanted to show you, a, I brought a picture of my mother, and she's in heaven now, but this is a picture of when we were little. So you can see this downstairs when we all go down for children's church. And there I was, this cute little girl. And that's my brother. He usually stands in the back. I don't see him right now. And, oh, there he is. Yes, there he is. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just didn't see you. And um, I think we're all dressed up because we're going to church. And I wanted to ask you a couple of questions, some of the things that remind me of our mom. What's this? What is it, though, for sure? What do you make out of it in the morning for breakfast? And it's gooey and goppy, and I really didn't like it very well. But my mom said we have to eat a good breakfast. Was she being mean? You sure? I didn't want to eat it. What do you think? Why wasn't she mean? So I would be healthy? Is that it? She wasn't being mean. What about this? What a, and she used to get us up early for school, get our teeth brushed and our hair combed and everything, and Sunday school we had to get there. We didn't want to get up. We were kind of tired. Do you think she was being mean? And was it important that I go to school and Sunday school and church? Hmm. So she's kind of actually being a good mom at that point, huh? And then you probably don't understand this, but I was 12 years old before we had television at our house. So we read a lot of books. That's, that's, you guys are laughing. It's true, isn't it? And I read a lot. I probably didn't read as many as Janeth. But I read more than Gary, my brother back there. But when we got television, we went crazy, wanted to watch it all the time. And what do you think our mother said? Yes, and what about, what does this remind you of? You better get your homework done. And she used to tell me you have to practice my piano. And was she being mean? Are you sure? I had to practice that piano all the time. And I never got as good as Dennis. Now, what about this? What do you think she made what do you think she made my sister and me do? The boys didn't have to. Was that fair? What was it? What is it? That's right. We had to wash the dishes. Was she being mean? Are you sure? What was she trying to teach us? <laughs> teach us to work, teach us to keep our house clean. Yeah. 
Now, are, are there some times that your mom, Mason, I know, I know you, are there some times when your mom says, does, makes you do things you don't want to do very much? Lane, what about it? You have such a nice mom. Do you, does she still make you do things you don't want to do very much? Why do you think she does that? Because she, what? Loves us. Today, will you think of that when it's Mother's Day? Will you think of all of the things that your mom teaches you? Because God has told her she has to take care of you. And grandmas, too, and aunts and uncles, all of those people get to take care of you. And they want to do a good job. Now, we are going to go downstairs. We're going to walk now, and we're going to make something special. So wait for after church. Doesn't preach too long. <laughs> And that, my friends, is what we call a tough act to follow. <laughs> All of you parents that heard your, your little children say that you're not being mean, but you make them do those things because you love them, and all the kids nodded, uh, the video will be up on YouTube next week. <laughs> uh, can we all agree that sometimes life gets messy? Sometimes life gets well beyond messy. In fact, I think it's kind of interesting that we stumble upon this topic on Mother's Day. Because I was talking with a friend of mine a while back about a, uh, a minor inconvenience, uh, but an inconvenience nonetheless. I, I was walking in, we were going to have breakfast that morning, and I was walking in and I walked by his, his truck, and I noticed this big scrape on the bumper. And so me being the nice person that I am, I naturally inquired about that beautiful scrape. And he told me the story about how that scrape came to be. Because he was, uh, he was at work one day, and every time he goes to work, he parks in the exact same spot. And I don't know if you're acquainted with downtown St. Paul or not, but uh, the Kellogg ramp near the state capitol. And he parks in the same spot every, uh, every session or every time he's there for work. And he parks between two pillars, right? Does everyone hate car ramps? That, that might actually be an amen sort of thing. Because what are you always worried about? The, the door ding, right? Because cars are getting bigger. I guess some are getting smaller. But we, we just run into issues. And, and someone always just... Hits you. And so he parks in this spot. It's in between two pillars so that he shouldn't get any door dings. And so when he came out to his truck, he discovered not a door ding, but this huge scuff on his bumper. He was well protected from the sides, but apparently not from the back. And so what, what, what do you do when something like that happens? You go around to the front and you look at the windshield hoping that you find a note, a business card, some caricature. I don't know. You're, you're looking for something. But whoever did this to his truck didn't, uh, didn't leave such a thing. And I was thinking about this and then I realized that even though uh, he didn't know whoever did this, he didn't know him by name or he didn't know him by, you know, he couldn't have seen them. There was no identity. There was no person to tie to what happened. Even though... Uh, he didn't know exactly who caused the damage to his truck. There was somebody to blame. There was someone in that parking ramp or who had just left that parking ramp that was to blame. We might not know who it is, but someone is to blame. Someone is responsible for that little memento left over from work that day. But what do we do when we've got someone to blame? Or, or, I take that back. What do we do when we don't have anybody to blame? What if we find ourselves in that situation? I'll be a little transparent. I know what I'd do. Um, what do we do when we don't have anybody to blame? What do we do when we get sick? What do we do when our loved ones pass away? What do we do 
when we get laid off from work by no fault of our own? What, what, what do we do when, when there's no one to blame, when tragedies happen, when natural disasters take place, and, and they take the life of even just one person? What do we do? Who are we supposed to blame? Because don't we want that? We need somebody to blame. We need someone to just to take to task over what whatever happened we we demand justice and and justice demands that there be a defendant and so sometimes when those sorts of things happen don't we you know even sometimes direct our anger toward god in some cases we come to think that because we have an illness or we have a disease or we lose our jobs or or that whole host of things that it's because god allowed that to happen and we get mad at him. In some cases, tragedies may strike, school shootings, World Trade Center, uh, ethnic cleansing, the list goes on and on and on. This world is no, has no shortage of tragedies and atrocities. And so we get mad and we blame God for allowing all of those sorts of things to happen. In other cases, we just see what other people do. You know, churches that picket the funerals of soldiers. When we see, we see these things that happen on television, we read about them in the newspapers, we hear about them in, in, uh, on the radio, and we get mad, we get angry, we get just downright mad with God because he, didn't, he did not then and there exercise his supreme power by putting them to shame. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever been angry with God? Have you ever been so mad or so hurt because of something that happened or maybe because it was something that didn't happen and that anger that drove a wedge between you and your Father in heaven? This morning we continue our series on forgiveness. We're going to be, uh, we're not going to be talking about how we can forgive others. We're not going to be talking about how we can receive the forgiveness extended to us by others. We're going to talk about something that I, that I believe precedes both of those. That being, how can we forgive God? We're going to take a couple of steps before we get that far. I realize the question sounds a little peculiar. And so I'm going to open with a word of prayer. Would you pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, sometimes we need somebody to blame. Maybe it's someone else, maybe it's ourselves, maybe it's you. And so as we talk about what really is a difficult subject talking about our relationship with you and the dynamics of that. And, and, and Lord, to be frank, how, how just downright mad we can get at you sometimes. I pray that you let your light shine, that your spirit breathe truth into our hearts and minds this morning. Help us to understand about everything about the grudges that we sometimes hold. And to help us go depart from your house this morning with a better understanding of, of who we are in Christ Jesus. Thank you for this time. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So how do we forgive God? And like I said, I realize that that sounds peculiar. And so let me first clarify what I mean when I say we need to learn to forgive God. You see, forgiving God is not like us forgiving someone else who has hurt us or or someone who has stolen from us. And it's different in one pretty big way. In fact, it's pretty significant. That, that difference is, is that God, the Lord our God, is incapable. That, there's more to add to it. That even sounds more peculiar than how do we forgive God. The Lord our God is incapable of doing wrong. While our brother or our sister may sin against us, may cause us hurts, may cause us harms because of his or her fallen nature, wrongdoing is far from the nature of God. The 92nd Psalm says this, it says, the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. 
Deuteronomy 32, 3 and 4 says this, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all of his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Those aren't exactly comforting words when you've got an ax to grind with God. Right? Because if, if there's no wrong in him, that makes the wrong fall on me, doesn't it? You know, when you're upset with God, you don't really want to hear how great and wonderful he is, do you? But it's the truth. Our God, regardless of how upset you are, regardless of how upset we are, at that specific moment in time, regardless of how angry you are, God is good all the time. There is no darkness in him. His perfect light dispels, casts out, gets rid of all darkness. And so when we talk about forgiving God, we aren't talking about entering this holy place where the train of his robe fills the entire temple. Remember that from Isaiah 6? And I saw the Lord high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the entire temple. So we're not talking about entering that place. We're not talking about entering uh, this, this place and standing before the throne of God well, wagging our finger at him because he sinned against us. That's not what we're talking about here. Even though it might feel like he's done us harm. We aren't talking about standing there de demanding an apology before we leave. That's not what forgiving and forgiveness is all about. But there are most definitely times where we need to forgive God. And so stick with me on this. Have you ever thought about being mad at God? Just ever kind of thought of that concept? And here's why I ask. Because it doesn't sound or if, doesn't it sound like that's kind of off limits, right? Like, whoa, um, I, I can't. I can't do that. There's no way I can approach God in that way. And if you remember last week, or you were with us last week, we talked about how we ought not to go before the throne of grace with any unforgiveness for our brother or our sister in our heart. How we can't enter that place asking for forgiveness when we have unrepentant hearts, when we have not forgiven others. And our conclusion last week was that that's kind of a, a bad thing to do. Let's just call it frowned upon, right? Does that then mean that we shouldn't go to God when we are angry with him for one reason or another? You know, are we supposed to just, you know, it's the end of the day, are we just supposed to, you know, get down beside our bed and, and kneel and give, him, give God these just thoughtful, meek and mild prayers at the end of our day, even though that's not what we're feeling? It's kind of a tough question, isn't it? Or maybe it's not. Maybe that's the whole point. Maybe it's when we stop and think about what we're doing, it's really not that hard. Is it okay to be mad at God? Have you ever been so angry with God that you just plain couldn't hold it in anymore? Are we allowed to do such a thing? And oddly enough, not oddly enough, Scripture speaks to this very thing, this very phenomenon. There's so much truth in Scripture, and we talk about everyday church for everyday people. We talk about applying biblical truth to our life. It is there. Even in these times when we are just angry with God, there is truth in the Scriptures for us. And so if you have your Bibles with you this morning, you care to follow along, we're going to read the entirety of Psalm 88. It's 18 verses. It's kind of a lengthy passage. Uh, the words will be up on the screen as well. But I have come to believe that this psalm in particular is one of the most comforting psalms in the entirety of Scripture. When we think of, of comfort in time of need, we normally think of the 23rd Psalm, don't we? You know, he he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. But when you're hurting, well, sometimes you need the 88th Psalm. 
This is a lengthy passage, but it is well worth the time. Let's read this together. Just pay attention to the tone, the, the feeling, the personality that are in these words. O Lord, the God who saves me day and night, I cry out before you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to hear my cry, for my soul is full of trouble and my life draws near the grave. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like a man without strength. I am set apart with the dead like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who, who are cut off from your face. You have put me in the lowest pit in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily upon me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken me uh, from my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, O God, every day I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do those who are dead rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, O Lord. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Why, O Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth I have been afflicted and close to death. I have suffered your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken my companions and loved ones from me. The darkness is my closest friend. Not exactly the cheeriest psalm in Scripture, is it? Here's why I find this so comforting. It's because it's here. It is there. It is there to help me. It is there to help you when you're feeling just mad at God. Remember how we said when we're angry with God about the, the verses about how God is so good and God is so wonderful and how there's no fault in him about how those don't really help in those moments? We can read and gain comfort from passages like that, psalms like that, and realize that, you know what, there are other people who have felt the way that I feel right now. There are other people that have walked through the valley of the shadow of death. There are other people who have been downright mad at a God that loves them. Others have felt deserted. And you know what, it's okay to be honest with God. If you want one takeaway this morning... It's that. It is okay to be honest with God. My God can handle that. It isn't marching up to God's throne and just wagging your finger at him saying that he is to blame for everything that goes wrong in this world. It's not that. But a huge part of our forgiving and being reconciled to God is being confident that he can handle it. We can be honest with him. You don't think God knows how you feel? I mean, that's the interesting thing. If we just take a step back and we, we, we think about what we're talking about, we're like, well, yeah, I guess it's kind of stupid to not be honest with him. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Scripture says, before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. He knows what's going on and we're probably better off to communicate that with him. I think of it this way. Man, have you ever been sitting across the table or across the room from your wife and you just know that something is up? You know that something, you know, it, 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 something's going on there. You just know that something is wrong. And so what do you do? Because you care about her. Because you care about her and you, and you want to, to comfort her, you ask that wonderful question, what's wrong? And you know, all joking about that question aside, if there really is something wrong, 
What is the worst possible answer that she can give you? Nothing. The worst possible answer that she can give you is nothing is wrong. Actually, the silent treatment probably actually makes me more upset, but, but nothing is wrong is the worst possible answer. And that's the worst answer, not because nothing is wrong, but, but because something really is wrong, and you don't know what it is, and, and then there's no way that you can help. That's what, why that hurts, wives. Uh, <laughs> it's because we love you and we want to help. We want to help, and sometimes we screw up and we want to fix it. That's a, we're getting into a whole nother sermon. But it, <laughs> but it hurts because we want to help. Now imagine that same scenario with our God. He knows that something is going on, but we aren't offering it up to him. We aren't inviting him into who we really are, into our being, into what's really going on in our, li- our lives, our, our innermost being. He can handle it. You know, just for a moment, get this image in your brain. Picture Jesus hanging on that cross. It's the ninth hour. It's before the side has been pierced. He's hanging from nails in his hands and in his feet. That crown of thorns has been thrust upon his brow. His back has been just brutally flogged by a cat of nine tails. He's hanging there on that cross and it is the ninth hour. Do you remember what Jesus cries out to his father, our father in heaven? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't really know that there are more chilling words that a loving parent's ears could hear. God can handle what we're feeling. And when we are open and honest with our God, we invite him to do the healing. We invite him to do the healing and to begin that reconciliation process. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See, there's some important words in there. When we go to God uh, in prayer and in petition, we can bring everything to him. Not just our requests, not just our concerns for others, but everything. Even how we feel, even if that means that we need to tell our Father in heaven that we feel forsaken, that we feel hurt, that we feel wronged, or even that we're just angry. He can handle it. And when we do those things, what does this verse imply? When you do those things, when you go to God in prayer and petition, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If we do X, then God is going to do Y. God will begin that process if we are open and honest with him. It is the peace of God that will allow him to calm our fears, to heal our our hurts, to restore our relationship with him. And here's the other difficult part about that. Um, He can handle that. But we also ought not to go before him and demand an explanation. That's kind of tough sometimes. You know, even when we were reading the psalm, why, oh God? He can handle that. He also doesn't really owe us an explanation. God told Isaiah these words. He said, for my thoughts, they're not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. We can trust in God's sovereignty. We can trust in God's power. We can trust in the reign of God. We don't need an explanation. We shouldn't demand an explanation. And to be honest with you, even if he gave us one, if if we were able to step back and see the entire history of time unfolded, we probably wouldn't understand where our little affliction fits into the entire process anyway. But yet we want to know. He is in control. 
He is in control of the entire cosmos, the cosmos that he said, let there be light, and there was light. This entire thing that he breathed into existence, he can handle it. He's got it. He can handle our hurts. He can take it. If we're angry with him, he can, he can handle that. When we are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, we need to know and trust that God will guide and protect us through that valley. We need to remember that even though it hurts, even though life is messy, that our Father will protect us and guide us by his rod and his staff, that he will again make us lie down in green pastures, that we will again, that he will lead us beside still and quiet waters and, and that he, the good shepherd, will restore our soul. We can trust in his wisdom, his sovereignty, his love, And his promises. For we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. When we go to our Father in heaven, be open and honest about what we're going through. Because he'll comfort us. We're not going to hurt God's feelings. He can take that. We may not understand it all, but praise God, we don't need to. Our pride will be replaced by his peace. Our struggles will be supplied by his strength and our hearts will be mended by his healing. Healing that only comes through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So if you're here this morning and you're thinking that he can't handle it, or you're thinking maybe you're too flawed to be forgiven, maybe you're feeling hurt, you're feeling wronged, you're feeling broken, you're feeling bruised or burdened, What did that scripture say? Take everything to God by prayer and petition and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. He can handle it. We can't allow God to forgive what we're holding on to. He can take it. And so as we enter our corporate prayer time, you know, maybe you need to be honest with God. Or maybe you need to ask for a little bit of that peace and say, you know what, God, I don't know why this happened, but I'm still angry about it. I know people who have had a tragedy strike in their life. Maybe it's a disease. Maybe it's a lost job. Maybe, I I don't know what it is. And all of a sudden, their perspective on who God was changed. That unforgiveness, that anger towards God drove a wedge between them and God. And God is steadfast. He stayed here. But they went over here. God can handle our hurt. He can handle our anger. (laughs) 